Good morning. Good morning. I have waited several years. to say this and uh, only because of the work that was done on this mainland trip to Chicago and Seattle and the preparation that we have had since this series began can I say it now with any hope that it will be understood but I have a complete conviction that it can be understood and that each one who hears this message, not only in this room, but those who will hear these tapes and those who may someday read this in print, will be ready to understand and willing to experience for a short time an inner struggle until they get on top of the subject of the understanding and of the demonstration. You have been studying truth, most of you, for many years. <clears throat> some through Christian science, some through unity, some through new thought, and now through the infinite way. And it must have entered your mind many, many times why, if these things are true, am I not demonstrating them? Or am I demonstrating so little of them? Or even if I am demonstrating a good deal of them, why, if they are true, are so many uh, in uh, truth study demonstrating so poorly. Why, if disease is not a reality, and we know it, why is there so much disease even among true students? Why, if God is really all in all, the only intelligence of the universe, and uh, divine love why after we know that and after we know that I and the Father are one why doesn't that perform miracles of healing regeneration and supply why after three quarters of a century of metaphysical studies are there so few really capable practitioners? Why, if I am faithful in knowing the truth and I realize that God is all, and that God is the only law and the only cause and the only substance, and the only being, why 
if I meditate every day and uh, declare that God's grace is my sufficiency, why can these things go on year in and year out and uh, so little improvement be noted either in my own affairs or the affairs of other students whom I am acquainted with. Or, if this is the truth, why is it that the metaphysical movements aren't growing, multiplying themselves ten times over each year, instead of lessening each year? And they are lessening. I know nothing about electricity or gadgets, but I do know that if someone tells me to plug in that instrument to the wall plug, that light comes out or music comes out or a tape recorder works or a toaster works. I know that if someone tells me how to drive a car that it only takes a few minutes or hours and then I can go and do likewise. I know that anybody with uh, just ordinary average intelligence can pilot an airplane after three hours of instruction. But I can study this for 20 years and not heal somebody of a headache. And yet, I've read the best books that are published, sometimes not only the best ones, but all of them, including the worst ones. But at least I've read the best ones and studied them, and still find after years that I can't heal a headache for myself or another. What is the answer to all that? You see, this is the very point on which in uh, my earliest studies I made a very grave mistake, one which I had to correct later. I was asked the question in the first year of my practice, Is there any responsibility on uh, our shoulder beyond knowing the truth, giving the correct treatment, knowing the truth correctly? I said, no, that is our only responsibility. After that, the work is up to truth itself. The truth does the work. Well, that isn't true. That isn't true. The truth doesn't do the work. Even if you had never had any false teaching in uh, metaphysics, if you had from the beginning had nothing but pure truth, and if you voiced that pure truth or wrote it or thought it, the truth still would not make you free. Understand this, even though it will, or may for a while, arouse a battle in you. It may be a battle with yourself, or it may be a battle with me. It may be a battle with the infinite way. But, if it does cause such a battle, you'll have to learn to take it for your own uh, unfoldment. Because I'm only saying this to you after 25 years. And uh, 
I'll stake all of the infinite way on that what I'm telling you today is the truth. Knowing the truth alone will not make you free. Declaring it, reading it, meditating on it, these are the things on which the metaphysical movements have wrecked themselves. Believing that reading truth, declaring truth, affirming truth, would heal us of our sins and our diseases, our lack and limitation, and in many cases, all it succeeded in doing was multiplying our troubles or perpetuating them. The secret lies in the fact that truth is not a mental activity. It has nothing to do with an activity of the mind. Therefore, it has nothing to do with reading, speaking, thinking truth. God is a spirit. And those that worship God, that is, expect to bring uh, the good of God into their experience through prayer or God conduct, must do so in spirit, not in the mind. The mind part, which is the letter of truth, killeth. When uh, we remain on the level of mind truth, the letter killeth. It is the spirit that makes us free. It is the attaining of the actual consciousness of truth that makes one free. It has nothing to do with how much of the letter of truth you know. The letter of truth plays a part in the work because above all things it gives us a working tool so that we can work with and through the mind to get away from the mind. Later on, it saves us from lapsing into a blind faith and a misapprehension of what is going on. For instance, in uh, the days of the Master, he healed the multitudes, he raised the dead, he multiplied loaves and fishes. But because of the ignorance of the letter of truth, people thought that that was a special sign given to this great master. And uh, therefore, they made no effort to go and do likewise. They merely maintained themselves as beneficiaries of his grace. They never thought that they themselves might attain that same healing power, that same multiplying power. No, no, no. He was uh, given this gift of God. And he had the power to give it to his disciples. Later, there were others gifted with a healing power. At one time, this is back in about the year 1400, no, it was later, 1600, there was a pastor in uh, a church in Germany in the very small town of Nuremberg. At that time, uh, nothing but a hamlet. And this man had the healing gift. And it was noticed that when sick people came to hear his sermon on Sunday, that very often they went away healed. Well, as a result of this, that man's attendance grew and grew until his church had to be conducted out in uh, the open air. 
And there were times when 10,000 people traveled to that little village just to attend his service on Sunday morning. And the reason he had this God-given healing gift, and they were coming to partake of it. And of course, when he passed on, that was the end of the 10,000 attendants. That was the end of his large church and congregation. And uh, they settled back again into just preaching on Sunday. Now, without understanding the letter of truth, that could very well happen again. You might have an idea that there are a few gifted people in this age, or a few hundred, or a few thousand, with some God-given uh, healing power, and then just sit back and accept the healings uh, from them, or the multiplying of loaves and fishes, and again the word would be lost. And generations might pass before it was again uh, given to the world. And so it is that the letter of truth will acquaint those interested with the great truth, first of all, that God is the infinity of being, but that God is individual being, and therefore, I and the Father being one, the wholeness of good God flows uh, through and from me. When you understand, or go a step further, that since God is this one infinite law, and I and the Father are one, all of the spiritual law there is must flow from my consciousness. And so, nothing out in the world can be a law unto me. I am the law unto everything out in the world through my oneness with God. And so we could go through all of the truth that we know and uh, that would awaken us to the fact that all that God is, I am. All that Jesus Christ did, I can do. And all the other saints and sages of the age. And so the letter of truth will bring us face to face with ourselves and from there on we can begin the work of bringing to light the demonstration of what so far we have accepted in the intellect, in the mind, as the truth of being. But, whereas the vast bulk of teaching and uh, of treating is carried on in the mind and through the mind with these truths they fail because the next step is omitted and the next step is attaining that mind or some measure of it which was also in Christ Jesus which would enable those works to be done through us we as human beings are not one with God. If we were, we'd never be in any trouble. We as human beings are not children of God, or we would never sin, and certainly never have a disease. We as human beings uh, do not possess all that God has, or we would never know lack. It is the Son of God in us, which is one with the Father. And that Son of God in us is, while we're in the human being stage, slumbering. That's why it has been said, Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give thee light. As human beings, we are asleep. That is, our Christhood is asleep in us. If it isn't asleep, it's buried under so many layers of this fabric 
of human existence, world beliefs, that it has no way to come out into expression. And so, when we have devoted some time to learning the letter of truth, we then must take the next step and say that while this is true, what of it? So what? It isn't going to do a thing for me and it isn't going to do a thing for anyone else. Unless or except in proportion as I can take the next step and come into the realization uh, an actual demonstration of what we call the Christ. It can be known by a dozen other names. We shall call it the Christ or Emmanuel, God with us, or the Son of God in us. We might call it our spiritual identity. But whatever we call it, we must bring it to light. Now what I'm trying to say to you is that supposing you present to me a claim of a headache, I could very easily say to you, it's a lie. It isn't true. It isn't a part of God. Don't you know that God is all in all? Don't you know that God is the only law and the only life? Don't you know you haven't even got a head because God is the Godhead and being infinite there's only one head and that's God's head and so you haven't got a headache. You'd say, you know, you're making my headache worse. Uh, your voice grates on me. It may be true what you're saying but, but I can't feel that way. I, I just feel rebellion when you say that to me. And you'd be justified because even if it is true, what difference does it make? You're still going to have that headache. Now, since I do have a background of the letter of truth, and I know that these things I've just said to you are true, I would be far better off as far as you're concerned and myself if I would say, okay, let me give you some help. And instead of wasting a single solitary minute with all of those metaphysical platitudes, cliches, and even truths, if you wish, if instead of that I will get back inside myself and just know that no matter what I know, it still isn't of any power. Why isn't it of any power? The only power is God. And God is a spirit. So if I get back inside of myself and remain silent until the spirit of God takes over, until the spirit of God announces itself in me, then I don't have to declare any truth. I don't have to know any truth because if you could name it, it isn't that anyhow. No matter what I would say, it isn't that anyhow. I might just as well let the Spirit itself do the work. Do you see that? Now, supposing, just supposing for a moment, that somebody presented me suddenly with a cancer. I ask you in all fairness, do you think I could do any more about it than you could? Or the surgeons? Do you think I have any more knowledge of what to do about a cancer than anybody else has? And the answer is definitely no. Definitely no. Nothing. And uh, I know that I could turn around and say there are no cancers in divine mind. I know all the words and some of the music. And all the statements that can be made, all the denials and all the affirmations, but I don't have any faith that they'd heal any cancers because I have watched for 25 years 
these people who know all these truths and declare them all. And eventually you have to uh, give up their practice. And those that have the cancers usually end up giving up their lives, their human sense of life. But I can say this to you. There is a spiritual power. There actually is. You can't see it any more than you can see electricity. Probably when the first people told us that there was electricity, or told the world there was electricity, perhaps they also doubted it because you can't see it. But nevertheless, there is a force in this world called electricity. For a long while, people believed there was an atomic power, but nobody could prove it. It was something not yet discerned. And uh, now all of a sudden we say, yes, there not only is electrical power, there is atomic power. Not only there is atomic power, there is hydrogen power. Who knows what more powers will be discovered. But I say to you, there is a spiritual power greater than all these. There is a spiritual power that nullifies every power that has ever been known to the mind. In other words, people have been drowned and uh, this spiritual power has brought them back from death. People have been injured in automobile wrecks and this power has brought them back from death. People have had every form of disease in the world and this power has brought them back. There is a spiritual power, but talking about it, affirming it and declaring it, doesn't bring it into expression. That's the point I'm making now, that I could sit here and talk electricity and atomic power and hydrogen power and never have one bit of them in this room. And so we could sit here and you can go home and... Uh, ride along in your automobile and declare every truth you know and yet not bring one trace of spiritual power into expression. But you can, without the use of words and thoughts, bring spiritual power into immediate availability. And you can do that by turning within yourself in silence. You won't do it in a tremendous degree at first. It is, a, it is a development. It is an unfoldment. But by acknowledging here and now there is a spiritual power which is the infinite all power of the universe. And this power is within me. It is closer to me than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. I cannot bring it forth through thinking thoughts. I cannot bring it forth through knowing truth. I can only bring it forth by a degree of interior silence through which I let it escape from me. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be land, and there was land. Let the Spirit be released and flow out from you, and it will be so. Now, the day must eventually come to our students when they know the nature of God the nature of prayer, the nature of individual being, and the nature of error. Those four things must constitute the basis of their knowledge of the letter of truth for two reasons. Once you know these subjects thoroughly, or we could add the fifth, the Christ, the activity of God in individual experience. Once we know those things, we never again can go off the hook into a blind faith. Neither can we go into the worship of personalities or of things or of thoughts. 
once we know these, the secret of these five things, knowing the letter of them, we are established in the, the letter of truth. And from then on we know that whatever is to be accomplished must be accomplished by not learning more things, but by permitting this infinite invisible spirit which we call God, or in its individualization in you and me, we call it the Christ. As the presence of God appears in individual expression, it is the Christ. Just like the sun in the heavens is the sun, but as it comes into your garden and mine, it is sunbeams or sunlight. It is still the sun, but is the sun as it is appearing uh, uh, locally here. And so God is God. But when God is manifested as your individual being or mine, it is the Christ or Son of God. It is still God. God the Father, God the Son. But instead of my looking out here and saying, oh, we have a dozen gods in this room, no, we have one God uh, and uh, a dozen individualizations or beams, but still all God. Do you see that? Now, the moment you know this and uh, there's a big step we're going to take right now. The minute you know this, you will be confronted with pictures of error multiplied from today on more than ever before. If not in your own experience, it will be in uh, those you see around you. Can't help it. Can't help it. That is the way it acts. That the moment we become aware of something, we become aware of it multiplied. But it is only for one reason, so that you may develop your response to it. Now, don't respond to an appearance of error with a statement of truth. Don't do that from this moment. Let the truth as you know it, uh, which now constitutes your consciousness, let be satisfied that, that you already know the truth. You knew it yesterday and the day before, so there's no need to repeat it today. But instantly get to this center of your being. Get in here as fast as you can and wait for the Father to speak or utter itself or declare itself or reveal itself so that if someone says to you, I have a headache, don't be tempted to answer even with a thought. Just grit your teeth and say, uh-uh, no answer to that. And then sort of wait a second. And you'll see that something will take place within you. It doesn't make a difference if it doesn't happen the first time. It'll happen very quickly. As you train yourself not to affirm or deny, but immediately close your mind Open your ears and wait. And let God do it within you. Let the Christ come into manifestation because it isn't your thinking that's going to help anybody. If it would, New Thought would have saved the world in the last 50 years. And if New Thought couldn't have done it, Dr. Peel would have done it. That isn't saving the world. That is just giving the world a lot of more mental work to develop more headaches with. If all of this uh, mental hodgepodge would do anything, psychology would be doing it. Instead of every department of life in which they're entered, the errors are increasing year by year. They're multiplying. Why? There is a, there is a rightful function for your mind. But your mind isn't a power, it's an avenue of awareness. You have the right with your mind to know that two times two are four. But you have no right to try to make two times two four with your mind. You have a right to know 
the infinity of God, but you have no right with your mind to try to push God into making it so. You have a right with your mind to know that God is the only lawgiver and therefore spirit is the only law and there's no law of disease. But with your mind, you can't make that law operate and you can't make that law a law. All you can do with your mind is to become aware of that which is, just like our inventors with their mind. They become aware of these natural laws and then uh, becoming aware of them, they hook them up. But they don't create any of those laws. Nobody creates laws of agriculture. Nobody creates laws of uh, architecture. All you do is open your mind and become aware of that which God created in the beginning. And so it is in truth work. Your mind has a normal, rightful function. When you read these books, you have a right through your mind to become aware of the correct letter of truth. You have no right to believe that your mind can make it so. Or any activity of your mind can make it so. Your mind is purely an avenue of awareness. Now, once I'm aware that two times two are four, I don't have to go around repeating it over and over again. And if I see a sign that says two times two is five, I don't even have to say two times two are four. I just have to laugh. That's all a smile. Or ignore it. Because no matter what I do with my mind, I won't change that sign. Nor will I change the fourness of two times two. So with this, someone has a headache, you're not going to change it. I don't care what you say. And I don't care what you think. You're not going to change it. But, because there is an infinite being called spirit, the introduction of that spirit into the situation will dispel any illusory sense. Now remember, that is why in our work you don't ever have to tell us the name of a patient. You don't. A telephone call came here, when was it, uh, less than two weeks ago, of uh, an automobile accident. And when they got, there were two women involved, and when they got to the hospital, they found one of them dead. But that didn't prevent their telephoning here, or one of the family telephoning here for help. And a few minutes later, the pulse began to stir, and uh, this week, that lady's walking out of the hospital on her own feet. Right? Now, I don't know the lady's name, I never met her. Nor did anyone tell me that she was dead. They merely said there's been an automobile accident. Two women are involved. They're on the way to the hospital. Will you give help? Certainly I'll give help. What kind of help can I give to a couple of women in an automobile accident on the way to the hospital? I don't know what part of the body's hurt, and I don't know what their name is. Do you see that? That knocks all of the mental treatments in the hat, doesn't it? Because... I can't fulfill any of the functions that you need to know to give a treatment. I don't even know who to give it to. Matter of fact, when the call came, I didn't actually know where the accident took place. It was in the middle of the night. I was wakened out of a sleep. It was a long-distance call, and it was only when I got the letter saying that the woman was found dead in the hospital, but that they stood there with her and waited, and the pulse came back, that I knew where this accident had taken place. <coughs> now, <coughs> you don't need anything more than that to know that the only part we play in the demonstration is uh, the holding ourselves in readiness in a state of living the infinite way so that when a call like that comes, we can get silent and let the Spirit of God take over. Let the Christ where is the Christ? Where is the Spirit of God? Why, God is individual being. So any Christ that I am experiencing here is that very person's being. There's no transfer of it from one place to another. God is that individual being as well as God is my individual being. And it only takes one with God to be a majority. 
Do you see that? Now, when I get very still and wait, I eventually get that deep breath in there that I call a click. Sometimes it's accompanied with an actual message. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's nothing more than that deep breath, but that deep breath is like a release. It makes me feel, oh, God's on the scene. I'm through. And then uh, it brings harmony into the uh, union corporation relationships. Sounds funny, doesn't it? It brings harmony to another person's bones and another person's heart and liver and lungs and uh, another person's eyes. Do you see that? We've had the experience here of an instantaneous healing of cataracts. Well, what do you think that was? Anything to do with knowing any truth? What truth would you know to heal cataracts? Well, you don't know any more than I know. And I've seen several cases not met in my own experience. Well, what's the difference between the one that was met and the ones that weren't met? Well, evidently, the activity of the Spirit was brought instantly to bear, and uh, that was that. And in the other cases, probably there was too much uh, unconscious fear of the word cataracts or uh, something else that got in there that didn't permit the pure activity of the Spirit. Do you see that? Uh, we are having a case right now of the same nature. It's also cataracts. I wish you could see the difference in the handwriting of the person from two weeks ago to this week, or three weeks ago. You would never recognize that of the same person. Every single word is written clearly. Every line is straight across. You can see that the vision has returned there. You know, you couldn't talk about a thing like that if you had any personal powers to make it so. But I can say to you that it isn't that way at all. The only part that a person plays in it is in uh, living the life so that the spirit can flow. You can't make a fool of God. God is not mocked. You can't talk spirituality and letting the spirit of God flow and uh, then be off on a Saturday night uh, jamboree. Nor can you fill your mind even with innocent card playing or a perpetual round of movies or televisions. or that, that can't be. I don't mean that you can't go and enjoy a movie now and then or a play. Uh, but uh, you cannot clutter up your consciousness with the filth of human existence and then expect to be a transparency through which the spirit can operate. Oh, that will not work. But that is the only part we can play is in maintaining uh, some measure of our uh, spiritual integrity so that we can be an open transparency through which the presence and the power can flow. Do not misunderstand me. I hope no one, whether here in this room or those who are hearing it on the tapes, will go out and try to teach this to young students. They must go through the letter of truth as we have gone through it. And we ourselves will have to maintain ourselves in the letter. We still will have to study those chapters on the nature of error, the nature of God, the nature of individual being, the nature of the Christ because that is part of keeping the temple clean. If we do not keep ourselves immersed in spiritual literature, if we are not keeping ourselves immersed in uh, what we are hearing, we soon will come under the mesmerism of the world and no spiritual power will get through. It is only because we are using these writings and recordings as if they were scouring soap, cleansing agents, that we can maintain the consciousness. That is why we meditate. That is why 
we contemplate God and the things of God. And we live in that contemplation. We say it's a mental activity. Yes, it is. It's a mental activity of awareness. And it's a mental activity which uh, enables us to keep the impurities of the mind out and uh, allow the mind to be a useful function as a state of awareness or as an avenue of awareness. And in that way, we keep the channels open for the experience of the spirit. Now, to put this into practice is what constitutes this first battle that we go through for quite a period. Because as you witness the discords, the diseases, the inharmonies of this world, your natural reaction as a metaphysical student will be to know the truth. That's the first natural reaction of a metaphysician is to say, oh, that's a lie, or that's no part of God's law, or, oh, God is infinite. And believe me, you've spoiled it right there. Because you have tried to function spiritually through the mind. Whereas if you shut it off immediately, refuse to be tempted to make a statement of truth or an affirmation of truth or a denial of error, grit the teeth, close the eyes, and wait, let God do it. Pretty soon you'll find there is a God. God is a reality. Christ is as much of a reality this second here where we are as the sun is shining in the sky or the waters are wet in the sea. Actually, Christ is a reality, but one which very few people ever experience. And that is because they function either as body or as mind. And they do not transcend these uh, to reach the spirit. We do not live by bread alone, either physical bread or mental bread. We do not live by things or by thoughts but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Who said that your words and mine proceeded out of the mouth of God? Why, God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Why think any then? Why not wait and let God's thoughts come to you? That's where the difficulty comes in in this work at first. You've got to wait until God's thoughts reach you. And that isn't easy. Because there is a million layers, a million years of layers of humanness, of the human mind, which is in itself a sense of separation from God. All these barriers of, of antiquity exist as barriers through which God seems unable to break, to get into our individual awareness. We uh, are the ones who have to open out that way and we do it by refraining from taking thought. We do it by taking no thought for your life or his life or her life. But waiting, waiting until God's thought comes through. Do you know that if, if the voice of God ever came through and said... Uh, Let's have water from these plants. Water would flow. But I can't make it happen and neither can you. None of us are gifted that way. But if it ever came through, you would see that it would happen just as in healing work. When that feeling or spiritual impulse comes through, I have seen and many of you have seen sick people jump out of bed. No question about that. It happens every day in the week. Wherever, and really and truly, this explains why Christian science will always be ahead of all the other metaphysical movements in its healing work, in its healing works. Because in its literature, it provides for the development of spiritual consciousness and acknowledges that there must be spiritual discernment 
that the letter of truth alone won't do it. The others don't do that. The others insist that if you learn the words in this book, and if you take an examination and pass by 92%, we'll give you a diploma and you can go out and be a healer. None of that seems to take into effect at all the fact that you can't develop a spiritual consciousness in three months, six months, nine months, twelve months, eighteen months, or twenty-four months. It has taken all the years since you have begun your metaphysical studies to bring you to a place where your spiritual consciousness is sufficiently developed that you can now turn around and say, good, now the letter of truth is embodied in me, I know the truth, and I'm ready now to let the voice of God speak. You go out and try to give this to a young student and see whether or not they can bring through the activity of the Christ. They can only do it if they are by nature attuned to it, not by the teaching of a mental practice. If they are by nature attuned, as some people naturally are, then, of course, they can bring it through with one day of instruction, you see. That's because they are naturally, spiritually attuned. Now, anytime you believe that mentioning the name of a patient or mentioning the name of a disease in your treatment has any spiritual healing power, you'll have to begin all over again. Or if you still are convinced that just by saying, oh, it isn't true, God didn't make it, that that is going to get you one bit along on this path, you are mistaken. There is but one answer at our period of unfoldment. And that answer is coming to a place of consciousness where we experience the activity of the Christ within us. I was reading yesterday about the school founded by uh, Pythagoras. He had ideas along this line too, but he had a very wise way, evidently, of teaching. When you came to him for teaching, he accepted you, and the first five years you couldn't see him at all. You could only study with his teachers. And uh, they prepared the way. At the end of five years, if you still wanted it, you could come and live in his home for three years. And then he would teach you for three years. And by that time, you had attained the second degree. By now, after eight years, if you were convinced that this is really serious business, you could turn over to him all of your fortune, and then he really would get busy and start teaching you. And I think he had something there. <laughs> Because I do know this, and I've said it before, that I wish there were a way that when people came to us for study, that they could be compelled to sign up for three years. Because you can teach the correct letter of truth in one year. You can't do it under that. No matter how clear it is in the books, the resistance of the human mind is such to truth that it is not, it cannot be assimilated. But in a year, if you had the correct letter of truth, you could teach it to a person in a year, so that at the end of a year, when they answered questions, they wouldn't make any mistakes. See, in this work, it isn't like other work, that if you get 94%, that's fine. This work, if you don't get 100%, it means you don't know what the truth is. If you can be made to give one incorrect answer out of 100, you don't know what the truth is. Because if you ever knew the truth, they could ask you a thousand questions. But you couldn't give a wrong answer. Because the principle is the same no matter what the thousand questions may be. And you either know the principle or you don't. And so if you got 99% in my school, you'd be left back. Because it would mean you do not know the principle. Do you see that? Now... Once you know the principle, you can't make any mistake in your answers. But, even though you know the principle, it doesn't say that you have developed any consciousness of it. And it is from there on, from the moment that you know the letter of truth correctly, from there on the hard work begins, because now you have to develop the consciousness of the truth that up to now you only intellectually apprehend. The things of God are foolishness with man. 
Do you see that? Man's mind cannot absorb. And so it takes a period of dying daily to this human mind that the mind that was in Christ Jesus can come to birth. And so it is that it has taken, and I can tell it when I'm standing in front of a, a class or a lecture group, that all I can do is to keep bringing out to them the correct letter of truth in one phase or another phase, even though they object to repetition sometimes. Uh, I notice that they still keep reading the Bible after 300 years in churches, and that's a little repetition too. It gets to be a little bit too much so sometimes. But there is no other way for the Bible to register in our consciousness than repetition. If you really heard the Lord's Prayer spoken in a quiet manner, and very slowly, very carefully, over a period of years, it would begin to register what the real meaning of it was. Whereas just knowing the words will not do anything for anybody. Neither the words of the Lord's Prayer, nor the words of the scientific statement of being, nor the words of any other prayer that's ever been known, or any other man from, will do anything while it is merely in the realm of the intellect. Once it gets behind the intellect and begins to register in consciousness and the soul, then you perceive an inner meaning to it, and this is the Christ power. Now, here is our mode of practice. Begin today, whenever any problem is presented to you, whether it is a problem of your own or another's, agree with yourself that you will not refute it, not deny it, and not affirm about it, but that you will close your mind to all of that and say, none of that makes any difference now. And just sit down and wait for this inner impulsion. Don't wait more than two or three or four minutes. If it doesn't come, then go back and try it an hour or two or three later. And if it doesn't come then, do it the same thing over again. Because in the beginning, I admit, this is hard work. There does come a time when uh, most of the problems that are presented to you uh, are quickly dispelled. Because the moment you close your eyes, that Christ comes right to light. Yet, at least in my experience, it is true that there still are problems that come to me that are not quickly met, which cause me to go back again and again and again and again for greater and greater and deeper and deeper realizations of the Christ. Once the true depth of it is uh, achieved, then it really doesn't make any difference what the name or nature of the claim is. It has to respond, and it does. And it is only the few that now really mean uh, sometimes long and sometimes hard work. Most of this work is much, much easier than water rolling off your back in the shower, I can tell you that. There's really nothing to it at all because most of it is not a conscious work at all. It is a work that takes place in consciousness without any conscious thought about it. And uh, just as I'm certainly not doing any conscious healing work here in this room, and yet I know that healings have taken place. But you see, that's all taking place as an activity of consciousness without any conscious thought about it. Now, that's what this comes to be eventually. It really is something that takes place within you. It's like the uh, song of the uh, nightingale. You sing your song, but you don't even know who's hearing it. And here, you live your life and you don't know, even know who's getting healed or of what. Because you're not thinking consciously in that direction. Inwardly, you're living always in a contact with this inner being. Now, do you see that if you were to persist in this 
refusing to take thought to use the letter of truth and uh, what to create this in a vacuum for the experience of the Christ that it would not be long until you experience the Christ once you have experienced it the rest is up to you uh, you can neglect it or you can achieve it occasionally or you can become so fascinated with it that you live consciously with that repeating it over and over and over again until eventually you don't have to do it consciously anymore it takes over your life and it lives your life you don't ever have to consciously make contact with the Christ the Christ is always that which is maintaining you in its contact you have do it, not doing anything to it it is doing it to you but that only comes with the degree uh, with which we are faithful toward the uh, frequent bringing to expression the activity of the Christ within us many people have the idea that after they've had a spiritual experience that from then on they are going to live in the kingdom of heaven and it isn't true it isn't many people have had spiritual experiences of different degrees and uh, found that that's the end of the experience and it doesn't come again and uh, their lives are not too much changed but when we have a spiritual experience and realize that that is but the beginning of a life that is to be lived in a new dimension not the dimension of body and not the dimension of thought but the dimension of consciousness